Bienvenidos a todos, todas. Um, ayer eh, estuvimos el día de nuestra conferencia centrada en ciudadanía digital. Hoy vamos a tener eh, bueno, una mañana completa dedicada a los robots sociales, que son agentes eh, con cuerpo que se pueden comunicar con nosotros de manera verbal y no verbal, y están irrumpiendo cada vez más en el escenario de las comunicaciones, en el hogar, en los hospitales, en los colegios, e incluso también ser compañeros nuestros. Eh, ahora quisiera eh, dejar con ustedes a nuestra decana Magdalena Brown, quien eh, nos va a contar más de los invitados que tenemos, que tenemos tres invitados internacionales de alto nivel. Magdalena, bienvenida. Hola Carmina, ¿cómo están todos? Hola. Partir antes que nada dando esa bienvenida. Eh, hay varias temáticas, bueno, como, como ha comentado Carmina, sumamente interesantes que los queremos ir, hoy día invitar a reflexionar. Pero muy brevemente déjenme tocar algunos temas y tal vez hacer una pequeña síntesis y poner puntos elementos en común con lo que conversábamos ayer eh, con respecto a la jornada de ciudadanía digital. Eh, en esta jornada eh, observábamos cómo las tecnologías están reconfigurando nuestros nuevos escenarios mediáticos, pero incluso nuestra sociedad, nuestra forma de relacionarnos a través de la exposición y la discusión que tuvimos con, con la profesora Livingston y con el profesor Lombana, pudimos observar cómo la eh, Internet en el espacio del hogar está reconfigurando las formas de ejercer la parentalidad, eh, la, la forma de ser padre, y también la forma en que nuestros jóvenes están construyendo sus identidades. De eso se trata justamente el tipo de reflexión que nos queremos invitar, de cómo nuevas tecnologías y nuevas formas de comunicar están cambiando no solo a nivel macro en nuestras sociedades, sino también a nivel micro, en nuestras propias vidas cotidianas. Hoy continuaremos justamente en esa tarea de observar a partir de la evidencia siempre una tecnología emergente, que en este caso, tal vez hace hasta un poco tiempo atrás, estaba más situada en el ámbito de la literatura, de las especulaciones. Hoy día estamos hablando de la robótica robótica social, eh, y requiere una mirada interdisciplinaria y que requiere una mirada también desde las comunicaciones. En, en particular creo que hay un tema muy interesante que nos trae la robótica social porque nos obliga a hacernos preguntas de base en nuestro campo, que tiene que ver como qué es la comunicación, es posible alcanzar el potencial de la comunicación humana tanto en su dimensión afectiva, empática y también cognitiva, a la luz eh, de agentes artificiales como los que estamos planteando, su carácter de sentido de horizontalidad, eh, bidireccionalidad que tiene la comunicación humana, ¿es posible replicarla en, es, en este tipo de nuevos agentes sociales? Bueno, esos justamente son el tipo de preguntas y reflexiones que los queremos invitar hoy día, donde ciertamente sus respuestas no solo son un aporte teórico, sino particularmente tiene implicancias pragmáticas en la forma en que vamos a poder aprovechar eh, o alcanzar todo el potencial de estas nuevas formas y estas nuevas tecnologías. Eh, el desarrollo, como comentaba la Carmina, eh, de la robótica social es creciente, trae nuevas posibilidades, nuevas potencialidades, eh, son muchísimas, ella hablaba justamente, eh, Carmina hablaba de la potencialidad en el ámbito de la educación, en el ámbito de la salud, pero todas estas nuevas potencialidades también van acompañadas con eh, nueva emergencia de posibles temores, ansiedad o riesgo que en general suponen las nuevas tecnologías, de eso también justamente queremos tener nuestra conversación hoy. Por todo ello, en esta nueva versión contamos con la presentación de tres destacados académicos que vienen analizando las implicancias sociales y comunicativas de los robots sociales. Eh, en el caso del profesor Peter, el primero de ellos, profesor titular de la Universidad de Ámsterdam, y antes también trataba temas sobre juventud e internet. Eh, y además tenemos a Autumn y Chad Agua, los profesores titulares, ambos de la Universidad de West Michigan, que también vienen analizando en forma, eh, con, digamos, con investigación de avanzada en estas temáticas, siempre entendiendo que este es un tema interdisciplinario, pero aquí la pregunta también fundamental para nosotros es la pregunta sobre las comunicaciones, como estas como formas de entendimiento 
comunicacional. Eh, esta línea de investigación ciertamente en otros países, como estamos viendo en otras, en otras universidades, está tomando mucha fuerza, eh, pero también acá en Chile. Y acá en Chile, eh, con orgullo podemos decir eh, que estamos también nosotros promoviendo este tipo de investigación, en particular en nuestra Escuela de Comunicación y Periodismo, eh, y en particular acá, bueno, Carmina, eh, eh, darte, digamos, las luces, Carmina es eh, profesora nuestra, eh, y yo felicitarla justamente porque nos ha permitido como escuela traer este nuevo tipo de temática. Carmina en particular, además se acaba de ganar su, un último, eh, recientemente, fondo de, eh, fondo de, CIT, de iniciación, que da cuenta justamente que cómo es una temática que también puede tener una implicancia más allá, eh, y también desde una perspectiva académica. Además, Carmina... Eh, está, y les va a contar de eso después con más detalle, nos va a presentar su proyecto RobLab, que es un primer laboratorio de investigación en robótica social a nivel regional, que va a estar afiliado justamente a otros laboratorios de nuestros profesores e invitados, y debería agradecerlos por eso. Eh, sin duda, estas temáticas, como hemos hablado y insistido varias veces ahora, eh, traen y eh, cristalizan las nuevas tipos de preguntas que desde las ciencias sociales y desde la comunicación nos tenemos que hacer. Esto requiere miradas eh, de investigación, eh, que del cual nos gusta eh, adherirnos como escuela de comunicación y periodismo. ¿Por qué? Porque tiene rasgos que son fundamentales para el tipo de investigación que requerimos en estos tiempos. Primero, su carácter interdisciplinario. Segundo, una visión de futuro. Y eh, y al mismo tiempo haciéndose la pregunta sobre los posibles impactos sociales y sobre todo un entendimiento de las comunicaciones ya no solo como una práctica, un ejercicio profesional, sino sobre todo como una ciencia de la comunicación. Eh, no me queda más que introducirle y invitarlo a escuchar con atención a nuestros expositores que vienen y sobre todo agradecerle a ustedes que están acá, pero a todo nuestro equipo que está detrás de esto. Yo ya hablé antes de Carmina, pero quiero volver a reiterar los agradecimientos a Sebastián, a Ayana, a Juan Pablo, a Valentina, a todo el equipo que está detrás de este Zoom y también a nuestro traductor que nos permite tener esta conversación en forma... Eh, eh, como eh, acorde a estos tiempos eh, bilingües. Así que muchas gracias y estamos en contacto. Muchas gracias Magdalena por esas lindas palabras. Yo también me quiero sumar a los agradecimientos a todo el equipo UAI que está detrás de esta transmisión y de esta conferencia Cultura Social Media que está en su segundo día dedicado a la robótica social. Eh, también quería recordar nuevamente que tenemos la traducción simultánea eh, en el botón eh, del mundo. So, for our guests from abroad, please remember, you have uh, down on your screen, you have a world button, you can click on it, and then you can follow uh, in English, of course. Eh, pero ahora, bueno, eh, voy a contarles del programa. Eh, como Magdalena ya bien dijo, tenemos tres invitados de lujo, la verdad, y para mí es una gran satisfacción poder tener a, eh, a los tres aquí. Eh, el primero de ellos va a ser el profesor Jochen Peter, y eh, luego vamos a tener la presentación del profesor Chad Edwards, y eh, vamos a tener eh, también, en tercer lugar, la presentación de la profesora Autumn Edwards. Eh, luego eh, yo voy a presentar también cortito, como dijo Magdalena, el, el proyecto Robot Lab, que será el primer eh, laboratorio eh, según tengo entendido yo aquí del, del país, establecido en una región, para estudiar la robótica social desde la comunicación. Eh, paso entonces ahora a presentar a nuestro keynote speaker, a nuestro eh, comentarista principal, el primero de ellos, como comentaba Magdalena, es el profesor Jochen Peter, quien es profesor titular de la Escuela de Investigación en Comunicación de Ámsterdam en los Países Bajos. Él eh, lidera el proyecto Child Robots, que está financiado por el Consejo de Investigación Europeo, eh, que este proyecto se enfoca en eh, investigar los efectos de la interacción con robots, especialmente en niños. Eh, Jochen en este momento nos va a entregar la presentación titulada Robots Sociales, Alcances y Hallazgos sobre Máquinas que Interactúan con Humanos. Le damos la bienvenida entonces a profesor Jochen Peter. 
Eh, quisiera recordarles nuevamente de la traducción simultánea, así que voy a dar un pequeño aviso en inglés nuevamente. Uh, for those of you uh, joining from abroad, again, uh, thanks a lot for uh, joining us. Uh, I would like to remind you again that uh, when you uh, have your, uh, your Zoom screen, uh, you can find the interpretation button uh, below, uh, and it has the shape of a world, and then you can uh, choose uh, whether you want to hear uh, the English translation. Um, Ahora voy a presentar a nuestro próximo invitado, que es el profesor eh, Chad Edwards, que eh, nos viene eh, a conversar. Eh, él está ahora en, la, en um, Michigan, él es de la Universidad de Western Michigan, es profesor titular de ahí. Eh, él es también codirector del Laboratorio en Comunicación y Robótica Social, con Botlabs. Eh, y sus intereses en investigación se centran en la comunicación humano-máquina, en la interacción humano-robot y la inteligencia artificial. Él además eh, fue presidente y director ejecutivo de la Asociación de Comunicación de los Estados Centrales eh, o la Central State Communication Association. Para mí es un eh, gran placer y honor eh, entonces poder presentarles eh, al profesor Chad Edwards eh, y él nos viene a hablar de un tema muy interesante porque tenemos estos nuevos agentes que, eh, como dijo el profesor eh, Jochen, eh, tenemos, digamos, eh, relaciones con ellos de confianza, eh, pueden influir en nuestro comportamiento y la gran pregunta que a muchos les sobresale ahí es ¿Cuál podría ser el rol de estos robots sociales en la educación? Este será el tema eh, que nos va a presentar el profesor eh, Chad Edwards, los robots en educación. Thank you so much for having me at this conference at UAI. I'm excited to talk to you about human-machine communication and education. Thank you to the organizers and a special thanks to Dr. Carmina rodriguez Hidalgo for the invitation. I look forward to talking to you later in the question and answer session. Take a look at this picture. This is a picture of my airport that I travel back to a lot in Dallas, Texas, DFW. And on this picture, you can see a train, you can see various airport cars, and you can see an airplane. Everything on this screen can be automated through computer technology. Planes can fly themselves, the trains can drive themselves through automation, same for the baggage car and the vehicles. We live in an exciting time where things are changing, and it's important to theorize and study this new emerging concept in education. Human-machine communication in the classroom is important to understand because it's going to change how we do education. Autumn and I defined it as students' instructors are not only talking through machines, but also to them and within them. Or McDowell and Gunkel said the machines are not coming, they're already here. Whether it's e-learning software, course management software, artificial intelligence in the classroom, we're going to be using AI and social robotics in the classroom, in the educational context, in many ways. And it's important to be at the table now talking about how we can interject the best practices and theory into this conversation. HMC has the ability to disrupt some of our most basic assumptions about communication and education, and it's important we study those. Take a look at these few headlines from the last few years. Actors, teachers, therapists, think your job is safe from artificial intelligence? Think again. What robots and AI might mean for university lectures and students? Or imagine how great universities could be without all those teachers, implying it would be AI or social robots. We've seen this type of moral panic in the past, and we're seeing it right now. Will AI and robots take over teacher jobs or change the education landscape dramatically? This is all about a moral panic, but we've had moral panics in education before, so let's go through some of those. I love this picture because it shows school-aged children all looking at their phones. 
And many people look at this picture and think, oh, we've seen a dramatic decrease in conversation. Interpersonal communication is dropping. These students are tied to their technology. But let's look at some other pictures. Here's a picture from about the time I graduated undergraduate at Texas Tech. You'll know all of these students reading the newspaper. Or much earlier in the 1940s and 50s on a train, all of these passengers on the train reading the newspaper. Or going back to the 1890s, miners all reading the newspaper. What's the big difference between all these pictures and the current picture you see on the screen? In the previous pictures, they were reading news stories, which is great. But in the current picture, these students are looking and reading, but they're also interacting with others. They're probably talking to their friends on social media, or texting, or talking to grandma via FaceTime using the iPhone system. In other words, we still use technology today, but we're now interacting with others at such a greater level that couldn't exist previously. But this kind of moral panic has happened in education before. Plato is famous for not wanting students to write things down, but rather have them memorized. Teachers had problems with the abacus, the calculator, the pencil, or even the smartphone. But yet we've made changes when we've adopted. There's been advantages for all of these types of technologies and disadvantages. And it's important that we don't necessarily fight the new technology, but we learn how to work it. We learn how to make it beneficial for what we're trying to solve. So human-machine in the classroom, it's vitally important that we bring the sensibilities of instructional and interpersonal communication researchers and scholars to bear on these issues at the earliest possible stages in design, policymaking, implementation, and evaluation. We as scholars have to be at that table helping make those important decisions. Whether it's a chatbot in the classroom that students might talk to in order to find out information about their course, whether it's a telepresence robot teaching different languages, here's a picture of a telepresence robot teaching English as a second language to students in China. Or it's students learning to code using a now robot. The point is AI and social robotics is going to impact us now, in the near future, and probably much longer than that. And it's important that we take the steps to understand how to evaluate this new technology new kind of technology in the educational sense. So today I'm going to talk about three sets of studies and then some case examples. And we're going to go through each one of these rather quickly. First, in 2016, we published a study looking at robots in the classroom. And we had two basic ideas. We had a robot as a teacher, so a socially a social robot teaching a small lecture. And then we had a teacher as a robot, a teacher driving a telepresence robot. Think about this as like Zoom, Skype, video conferencing on a movable stick. And in this study, we were testing Sundar's main model, specifically the machine heuristic. Do we trust machines more given the context? And as such, this study was really important because it demonstrated that we can learn from both robots and people, and it's important to understand those distinctions. So in this study, we had three basic research questions. Will participants rate both the teacher as robot? Remember, this is the teacher using Zoom, Skype, video conferencing on a movable stick, a movable platform, a telepresence robot. Or as a robot as teacher, this would be like a social robot, as credible. Are they competent? Are they trustworthy? Do they care or have perceived caring about their students? Research question two, will the instructor agent type? influence those ratings of credibility? And then finally, will there be a relationship between the type of teacher, teacher as robot or robot as teacher, and effective or behavioral learning? So what did we find? We had 86 participants, 69% were women. Groups were greeted um, at a welcome desk and taken to the classroom in sets of 15. We had a research assistant tell them that a teacher would be instructing on the subject of business communication in a lecture that lasted about five minutes. We used a Manterobot classic telepresence robot. This robot is controlled over a Wi-Fi network, has a pan and tilt camera, has a monitor, and has a laser pointer. The lecture, both the audio and the video for this study, was pre-recorded and choreographed between conditions using Wizard of Oz research methodology. Wizard of Oz refers to the notion that you have a research assistant controlling the robot like the robot was controlling itself. So we essentially had two conditions, a person teacher and a robot teacher. And they both use this robot just depending upon the situation. 
So the monitor displayed either the human instructor's face video video conferencing software, this would be the picture on the left, this would be the teacher as robot, or a rendered robot face using the same person to model the appearance of an avatar, this would be the robot and teacher condition. Participants were led to believe that the performances were unfolding live, so we scripted the interaction between the wizard and the robot so that it appeared two-way and spontaneous, so students in the study thought this was happening live, real-time. We had the DVs of credibility and learning. So for research question one, for both conditions, the mean credibility score was significantly above the scale midpoint. In other words, participants thought the robot as teacher and the teacher as robot were both credible. Who was more credible? That was the person. And there was a relationship between the type of agent and learning. In other words, robots could be viewed as, viewed as credible and students reported learning. In other words, Sundar's machine heuristic was at play in this study. So it's important to realize that students can learn from social robots. It might be different. It may not even be as good as a person, but they can learn from it. And we argue it's based specifically on the type of context. In the second study I'm going to talk about, this is when students were presenting a speech to a robot. And we titled this, I'll Present to the Human, Effects of a Robot Evaluator on Anticipatory Public Speaking Anxiety. Research-driven assessments of social robots in, the robots in the classroom are needed to assess the actual value, rather than following the pattern of rapid technology adoption without adequate testing. In other words, sometimes we'll find technology that's implemented in the educational context without a lot of testing. People think it's going to work, they have a hunch it's going to work, and they just try it. We're making the argument in this study that we have to test these things out to see if they work, to look at the usability, to look at the case examples. Does it make sense? Otherwise, we might be just wasting money and time. So what did we do for this study? Here, we were going into the assumption of the human-to-human -human interaction script, in which says, when we're meeting a social agent, a machine agent like AI or robot, we have increased uncertainty, we will often have decreased social attraction initially, and we'll often have decreased perceptions of social presence with those interactions. And we've published several studies looking at these variables. For the hypothesis of the study, we argue that anticipation of public speaking, participants paired with a robot evaluator, in other words, a robot evaluating the person giving a speech, that person will have higher perceived ratings of public speaking anxiety than those paired with a person evaluating the same speech. So what did we do? We had 141 participants. We gave them the negative attitudes for robotics, a robot scale, and the public speaking anxiety. And we had two conditions. One condition, you present to a person. Second condition, you present to a robot. And again, we used Wizard of Oz methodology. We had our wizards tell participants they would be given, a 15, minute, given 15 minutes to develop a speech and then escorted to a room to perform that speech. And we had wizards stationed around the clipboards with stopwatches, making it seem very legitimate. Participants were told that either a person or a robot would evaluate their speech. We gave them no pictures and no descriptions. So we really didn't know what the students were thinking about other than a person or a robot would be evaluating their speech. The ANCOVA was significant in that higher PSA or public speaking anxiety for the robot condition. The effect size accounted for something like 9% variance of the dependent variable. In the third series of studies, we were interested in looking at machine agent voice. And in this article published in 2019, we're looking at evaluations of artificial intelligence instructors' voice and examining social identity. The basic research question here was, how will students with a high age identification rate an artificially intelligent instructor with an outgroup voice, and we defined it older, and I'll explain why, in terms of credibility, attraction, motivation to learn, and social presence. In other words, we were interested in students who perceive the high age identity of being with their peer group. So I am a young student, a young college student, and we wanted to see how did that work out when the artificially intelligent voice was older, and we'll explain what that means in a moment. For this study, we were using the computers of social actors paradigm and social identity theory to see if they worked very similar as they do in human-robot interaction, or HRI. So what did we find? First, we look at voice as a cue. 
Nass and Gong in 2000 argued that vocal characteristics provide socially relevant cues and that speech is important for these socially interactive technologies. We talk to our phones, we talk to robots, we talk to our computer. And so issues of likability and impressions are really important to examine and understand if we're to evaluate HMC in the classroom. And finally, the voice may involve the operation of the human-to-human -human interaction script. Higher levels of uncertainty, lower levels of attractiveness, lower levels of presence. And how do we navigate that in an educational situation? Social identity theory is the notion that our self-concept comes in part from our affiliations and our social groups and our group statuses. And that our group status is a person's feeling that their own group is better or worse than another group identity. So my school is different than your school. My age group is better or worse than your age group. And in the classroom, students in a high age identification category, in other words, they identify with being youthful or being their age, produce more age salient descriptions of their most and least favorite instructors than students that were in the lower age identification group. So with these two theories in mind, we wanted to tease out how would AI, an AI voice work in the educational situation? So we had 65 participants. We told participants they were gonna evaluate a new artificially intelligent software named ROS, the robotic operating system designed to teach. Ross developed a three-minute lesson on the dangers of sugar, and we used a basic off-the-shelf text-to-speech program to create the out-group older male voice, and this was incredibly challenging, because at first we used the program and we came up with a voice and we thought, oh, this sounds like an older male professor, so we gave it to a pilot group, and they rated the age at like 30. So we had, to keep going, we had to keep going and going, pushing up that boundary to where we thought they sounded incredibly old. But then when we asked participants, how old do you think this AI voice is? The average was 64.73. So it was really interesting in terms of perceptions of an older voice. We also had them draw on this task. And I love this picture because this is very standard. We asked them, what do you think the AI would look like if it was a person? just to help confirm the age of the voice and what their perceptions were. And I love what the student wrote here. It's not that I think he would have a small body, I just ran out of room. But you can clearly tell from the depiction of the face that they were thinking of an older male professor, which is really good for our stimulus that we had in this study. So we had an IV of age of group identification scale. We classified it into three groups, low, moderate, or high, and then the DVs of credibility, attraction, motivation, and social presence. In terms of results, the high age and moderate age identity groups rated credibility and pseudo motivation for Ross higher than the low age identity group. In other words, if you really thought about your own age group and you were in that high age identification group, you rated the credibility for the Ross, for the AI voice, higher than those that didn't identify with their age. High age identity groups rated social presence for Ross higher than the low identity age, very similar to the previous result. This seems a bit confusing though at first. At first, it seems to be counter to the predictions of social identity theory. My own work early on in my career argued that older instructors might be given traditional age stereotypes for wisdom or intelligence. And the findings here suggest that these stereotypes of the wise person occurred for the older AI voice instructor, if you remember, was an average of 64 years old, primarily by those students who are average aged of 20. One student wrote, Ross reminded me of an older man who has the voice and tone of someone who is knowledgeable and has been teaching for a few years. His voice was very comforting and not at all intimidating. I felt like he was very excited about getting his class involved in his teachings. It was a very strange thing to hear Ross speak, but it sounds like a real person almost. You get the sense from this participant they really thought hard about this instructor's voice and how it made them feel in their educational environment and in the context. Stemming off this, we conducted another study with Henry Goebel where we looked at the notion of vocal fillers in the voice. And we found that instructors or people who, robots who use vocal fillers had greater social presence. And what these two studies tell us is that imperfections help both robots and AI be relatable. We, students don't want the robot or the AI to be perfect. They want to have a sense of interpersonalness to it, that there's going to be some mistakes, there's going to be vocal fillers, and that makes them seem more people-like, more human-like. So in terms of use case examples, we've done many things in our communication and social robotics labs. We've done a telepresence librarian where we've taken these ideas and these theories and we've implemented them in a real world situation. For a period of two years, we had a telepresence 
robot in our library and our librarians would drive it around interacting and asking students questions and how did this technology work in this new environment and so we're still continuing these types of studies but it's important to take and create use case examples that make sense for the type of research you're conducting Probably every, prof every professor has gotten this question where they're emailed a question by a student and you simply want to resp respond, it's in the syllabus, right? So Autumn and I created Ada, Artificially Intelligent Digital Assistant for a Human Machine Communication class at Western Michigan University. And essentially this was a pedagogical agent, a chat bot, with the help of these four students that would answer those types of questions during the syllabus. And so Ada can answer questions about human-machine communication, virtual reality, augmented reality, how do robots work in the environment, when is the test, how do I turn in my homework, when are office hours. And so it potentially would decrease load from instructors to professors when we're looking at these type of use case examples. For example, right now we're using robot pets in our library. We know from research that therapeutic dogs and cats can help students reduce stress, but because of liability, risk reasons, we can't have real dogs in our library here at Western Michigan University. So we contacted librarians and said, hey, let's put some robot pets in there. And we're currently finishing up some studies on this area as well. The important part of this is that it's important to take these use case scenarios into the real world and see what happens in the educational context. Are we thinking about the Terminator top robot, robot destroying education? Or are we thinking about like a Geo type robot or a Pepper robot that could enhance the environment? I'm not a big believer that robots or AI are gonna replace professors or teachers roles. But just like learning management software, the smartphone, the calculator, the abacus, or even the pencil, they can help us, but we have to understand the advantages and the disadvantages of that environment. So what's next in our lab? We're looking at further looking at social robots in the classroom and AI for instructional technology, building chatbots and teaching other professors to build chatbots to help reduce some of that cognitive load of constantly answering that question, it's in the syllabus. Thank you very much for listening today and I look forward to the conversation and to your questions. For more information about the Communication and Social Robotics Lab, you'll see the website on the screen or my Twitter handle and I'll be happy to engage with you. Again, thank you so much for having me at this conference, and I look forward to talking to you more about human-machine communication, social robots, and education. I hope you enjoy the conference. Thanks again. Bueno, muchas gracias, eh, Chad, eh, Edwards, por eh, una gran eh, presentación. Eh, debo decir que como profesora eh, me gustaría mucho tener ese chatbot que le respondiera a, lo, a los estudiantes sobre el, el programa de estudio u otras dudas. Creo que todavía falta bastante por avanzar en la, en la interacción, en, en especial hablando de, de los chatbots, pero aprecio mucho los comentarios del profesor Edwards eh, en torno a sus investigaciones, a sus experimentos y a lo que ellos han encontrado con respecto al uso de robots sociales en la educación. Eh, para los que están eh, aún en sintonía, los que están eh, de nuevo incorporándose, eh, les quería hacer nuevamente el recordatorio sobre el botón de la interpretación. Remember that uh, you can, uh, below on your Zoom screen, you have a world button, and if you press that button, you can have the choice to follow the audio uh, in uh, the transport the translation. Okay, um, now, I will introduce, uh, perdón, sigue hablando en inglés. <laughs> um, voy a um, introducir a la profesora Autumn Edwards. Eh, ella también es eh, co-directora co eh, co del eh, laboratorio Combot Labs en la Universidad de Western Michigan. Eh, ella nos va a hablar de un tema muy interesante que tiene que ver con la ontología del robot social, es decir, los aspectos del ser del robot social. Es eh, un tema también vinculado a, a la filosofía y eh, a lo que significa la interacción con estos agentes. Eh, ella también les va a contar que es la editora de una revista que se lanzó recientemente, que ella misma inauguró, que es eh, una revista académica con respecto a este tema que se llama Human Machine Communication Journal. Así que, eh, bueno, sin demorarme más, eh, doy el pase a la presentación de la profesora Autumn Edwards. 
Hello, I am Autumn Edwards, Professor of Communication at Western Michigan University in the U.S., Co-Director of the Communication and Social Robotics Labs, and Editor-in-Chief of the journal Human-Machine Communication. I would like to thank the UAI and especially Carmina Rodriguez Hidalgo for the invitation. It's a pleasure to join you at the UAI Social Media Conference, and I look forward to sharing with you my keynote address, Social Robots from Ontology to Interaction. Today I'd like to share some data and perspective with you about how people might move from ontology, or understanding what a social robot really is, to choices for perception and interaction with them. And I'd like to begin by telling you two stories that piqued my interest in this topic. The first happened several years ago when our lab received a new robot. This is Aldebaran's NOW robot. And when we unboxed the unit, we had a simple goal of getting Nico to stand up. So we began with a simple command, Nico, stand. And when nothing happened, I noticed that undergraduate, graduate students, and faculty began to try other things. Some talked to Nico like a small child. Nico, please, will you stand? Others tried the commanding tone that you might use with a dog or domestic animal. Nico, stand. Some people reprimanded the robot. You know, why are you being so difficult? And other people corrected them. You don't be so mean. It's Nico's first day in the lab. And still others said, maybe we shouldn't try to interact with Nico through voice at all. Why don't we just force the command through a keyboard action? This interaction demonstrated for me that when faced with choices about how to deal with a social robot, Different people had different scripts and understandings about what a social robot really was and how it would respond. Around the same time, Boston Dynamics released this video to showcase its new creation spot. Now, as you can imagine, this video raised questions about the acceptable and appropriate treatment of social robots. When I show this video to my students, you know, I get varied reactions ranging from laughter because it, it trips and falls and it's kind of funny, um, to gasp, you know, people may be mortified, how could you do this, uh, all the way to shoulder shrugs, yeah, who cares, it's basically just a toaster. And combined instances like this, different opinions about the acceptable treatment of robots, about what they really are, led me to begin research trying to understand how we conceptualize the true nature and meaning of social robots. Ontology is the philosophical study of the nature of being, becoming, existence, or reality, as well as of the basic categories of being and their relations. And importantly, ideas about the nature of different entities are very practical. They prime us to run certain scripts for interaction, and we understand both our own and the other's nature by comparing similarities and differences between different types of beings. So our attempts to understand the essential natures of things often involve discursively constructed triadic relationships among entities. In other words, often when we're trying to understand something, especially a new or emergent category of being, we do this by comparing it to two other similar beings that help us articulate how we're the same and how we're, the di how we're different. Western philosophy has a long history of equating animals with machines. In fact, Rene Descartes famously said non-human animals are merely machines with their parts assembled in intricate ways. The fundamental difference between people and both animals and machines was simply our capacity for soul and reason and higher order thinking. In fact, you can look at past attempts to understand the nature of animals by comparing them to, to humans. Consider this passage, animals are beings with which we may have social relations. We feel sympathy and affection for them, but we also exploit them for our own benefit, for company, sport, or nourishment. They are persons and things, friends and food. We communicate with them, but we also kill, cook, and eat them. They're similar to us as well as different from us, 
which encourages us to imagine ourselves as them, to conceptualize our own being, and to use them as symbols to make sense of our world. And in many ways, you could substitute the word robot or social robot for animals in this passage and accurately summarize our complex relationship with sociable machines. We collect and care for them, but we also battle and break them. We nurture them, but we use them. They are to us both persons and things. They are both partners and tools. For this reason, Mazis has suggested that we might call the machine the postmodern animal. Because as we try to articulate similarities and differences from the machine, we're challenged to confront our own essential nature and how we stack up in that comparison. And in fact, you see many pop cultural comparisons of machines and animals today. There's a whole genre of children's literature, Robot in the Garden, which invites young kids to consider social robots as developing creatures, just as they would other non-human animals. And in fact, the first robot developed um, was a zoomorphic or animal-like design. Architus's steam-powered pigeon is the very first working model of a mechanical being. And those zoomorphic design trends continue in today's robots, which may range from very mechanical looking um, to much more lifelike. Another way we can reconstruct these triadic relationships is to compare humans to machines. And in fact, we are often compared to machines in the sense that the biomolecular interactions that take place inside of us um, are understood to give rise to our intellect and feelings and our sense of self, leading Rodney Brooks to conclude that you, I, and everyone we know is a machine. And our everyday terminology is steeped with comparisons of human beingness to machine beingness. We compare ourselves to computers when we say, that we need to be disconnected, or that we feel like we're running on autopilot. And in fact, physicists and philosophers have gone so far as to suggest that we are actually living in a computer simulation, that our own essential being is best described as algorithm or code. So to complete the triad, we are also used to comparing humans to other animals. This was popularized in U.S. America with Diamond's book, uh, The Third Chimpanzee, which uh, posits that because we share 98% of our DNA with chimpanzees, humans are best qualified as a third type than as their own separate classification. So in order to understand how ordinary people might make sense of the similarities and differences between social robots, human beings, and, um, and non-human animals, I introduced them to a task called Group 2 and Leave One Out. And I would encourage you to think about how you would respond to this task. Imagine three figures, a human being, a humanoid robot, and a hominoid ape. Now, working quickly, which two would you say are alike and belong in a group, and which one is different and doesn't belong in the group? So, after presenting these three entities to participants in random order, the data showed that among almost 200 U.S. American Amazon Mechanical Turk workers, um, the predominant tendency, 77%, said, you know, the human being is most like the chimpanzee or hominoid ape and least like the robot. Fewer people categorized the human being and the social robot as most alike, that was 15%. And the smallest category of all held the human being as separate and put the chimpanzee and the social robot into the same category. And if you remember, this is the Western philosophical tradition. I think Descartes would be very sad to see that so few people held the human being aside as distinct. After doing this task, I asked participants to share a little bit about their reasoning and decision making. So first, I asked the participants who grouped together the human being and the ape, the chimpanzee, what do these two most have in common? By and large, their comments focused on the fact that they shared status as living, breathing, alive creatures who were both animals and had some sentience, some capacity to experience the world in a meaningful way and also to suffer. 
Some also focused on their sociality and ability to uh, get along in larger groups, and they focused on their natural origins. So for some, ancestry um, came down to being shared because of genetics or evolution or DNA. Many people in this sample referenced the 98% overlap in genetic material. And still others stressed a divine origin of both humans and chimpanzees, which they said social robots didn't share. And that is that they were created by God or a divine creature, or, or that they were imbued with soul. When I asked these people what makes a robot different, they stress the fact that humanoid robots are mechanical, that they're programmed, that they're made by other people, and that they're lacking a certain life breath. For that smaller group of 15% who put together the social robot and the human as most similar in a group, they stressed the relationship between creation and creator. So the fact that human beings made social robots led some people to stress their resemblance, that they probably look the same, that they're meant to perform the same functions and fulfill the same roles, that they're smarter, and that this resemblance in form and function gave them greater possibilities for interaction. That is easier to work together, communicate, and control the actions of a social robot than it would be for a non-human animal. When I asked them what makes the ape different, why did they leave it alone and say it didn't belong in the group, participants stressed the fact that it was an animal, sometimes stressing it's a wild animal, unpredictable and controllable, and that it can't work together as well with humans as robots or machine communicators might be able to do. The final group, who held the human aside by itself and grouped together the machine and the ape, when I asked them, why did you make this group and why do they belong together? They stressed that both machines and apes shared status as something un or non-human. And this difference from humans um, rendered them not just distinct, but also inferior. So they were described as lower in intelligence, in their development, in their importance, and in their feeling. Quotes like this one explained why they held the human being separate as something that couldn't be grouped with the others. Uh, this is a computer scientist, he was 32 years old, who says the human being is lord of the planet and should stand alone from all lesser species. What makes a human different according to these um, participants is that humans are exceptional in terms of their intelligence, morality, logic, soul, and status. So this first part of the study shows that people do make different choices, different strategic solidarities between different types of being and understanding the similarities and differences between robots, humans, and animals. But the question becomes how might identifying the nature of social robots as more human-like more animal-like or as like neither, matter for our subsequent interpretation and interaction. And one of the most basic and interesting ways I think this matters is in the extension of empathy to other kinds of being. So you may have heard the widely publicized story of the robot hitchhiker called Hitchbot. This is a social robot built by Canadian professor Smith and Zeller, whose singular purpose was to try to solicit lifts across a series of countries and make it to its desired designation, all the while posting uh, updates to social media accounts and making light automated banter with people who stop to interact with it. Hitchbot did really well uh, getting across Canada and also the Netherlands. However, when Hitchbot was unleashed in the United States, things turned out very differently. Only two weeks after it set about on its journey in Massachusetts, Hitchbot was found destroyed, decapitated, and abandoned in Philadelphia's old historic neighborhood. And you can imagine that reactions to this were really passionate and also varied. You know, some people were extremely angry that Hitchbot had been killed, especially by U.S. Americans. Um, others thought, we're wasting our time to even worry about the treatment of a robot whenever human beings face so much suffering and challenges of their own. So I next presented my participants with the story of Hitchbot. It was this um, reporting from the New York Times that I asked them to read and then to answer a series of questions about what their reaction was to the destruction of Hitchbot. Almost all participants condemned the action outright. They said it was absolutely wrong, that it shouldn't have happened. 
However, what I noticed is that not everybody agreed on why it was wrong to destroy Hitchbot. And those differences in reasoning often related to the way they had completed the prior classification task. So those people who said the robot was other, that human beings are more like animals or chimpanzees, said things like this. It is wrong, but no more wrong than the destruction of a couch or a dresser of equal value. So these, pe these participants believed it's wrong to destroy or mistreat robots because it's senseless vandalism. It destroys other people's property, and they were especially critical that it was done for no reason. There was no apparent human instrumental purpose that drove this decision making, and therefore it was meaningless and shouldn't have happened. Those people who grouped together the human and robot as most alike and different from other non-human animals also believed it was wrong. But you notice that they use language that invokes the same kind of things we would say about the mistreatment of another human being. Abuse, cruelty, and murder. They tried to make sense of Hitchbot's demise based on whether it deserved to be destroyed. Unless he was hurting someone, please leave him alone. So those people who understood robots as very much like us in terms of the category of being also understood their treatment, much like they would the treatment of another person. And those participants, the smallest group of all, who believe that humans stand alone as exceptional and different compared to sociable machines and non-human animals, stressed that this, um, this act of vandalism or destruction was wrong because it hurts other people. So they either explicitly pointed out that this was somebody else's property, that a lot of work went into the creation of this, and it must have been very painful for the scientists to lose the project. They sometimes talked about what it said of the human race, in a virtue ethics kind of way. What does it mean about us that we would destroy something um, that was a social project? Or, like the third quote, I think whomever vandalized the robot was probably disgusted that so much effort went into a frivolous experiment when human suffering is all around us. A hitchhiking robot seems extravagant and wasteful and also a little creepy. This was um, one of the participants who referenced being creepy or um, uncanny, and that's perhaps not, um, that's understandable as social robots become more and more like human beings, um, for us sometimes to be a little bit uneasy with their resemblance, and sometimes we take that out on social robots in our interactional patterns. So the implications of work like this, beginning to understand how ontological considerations will lead to the way we think and behave towards robots, are that people have different understandings of the natures and relationships among animals, humans, and machines. We don't all think the same about this on an individual difference level, but also in terms of cultural constructions. It also leads us to think about how best to understand these emerging relationships with social robots. My own research, along with contributions from many other great scholars, would suggest it's important to begin our understanding um, in a constructivist vein, understanding first how we prototype communicative others. The first thing we tend to do when we encounter someone or something different is to think, what is it? Those uh, decision makings about what it really is then lead us to access stereotypes about what does it do? How is it probably going to behave? which then lead us to access our personal constructs, our ways of understanding how this particular actor may be different and the same from others in its general class. And finally, that leads to the activation and modification of interpersonal communication scripts that we use in our interactive um, experiences. Importantly, these understandings about um, social robots and how they're similar or different to humans may also influence how we behave towards, think about, and communicate with one another. So the future research that I'm engaged in, excited to, to continue embarking on, is to understand in greater depth how discourses, little d discourses between small groups of people, but also large societal conversations, and also designs, physical design of machines, influence or prime our identification of entities in ways that will influence our interactions. Also thinking about what are the consequences of our ontological assumptions 
about humans and robots. So I leave you with this political cartoon from the previous presidential primary election in the US. It demonstrates that sometimes our choices about how to compare human beings, social robots, and animals can lead to dehumanization of other people. So here you see just one instance of um, the attempt to delegitimize human actors by comparing them either to social robots and machines uh, or to animals. So I look forward to taking your questions and comments and hearing your good thoughts about these topics of ontology and interaction. Once more, thank you to the UAI and Carmina Rodriguez for organizing this exciting event. I look forward to hearing your insights, comments, and questions. Muchas gracias eh, a la profesora Autumn Edwards por esta interesante presentación. Eh, creo que los aspectos ontológicos y de cuáles son nuestras percepciones y expectativas hacia los robots sociales pueden moldear lo que nosotros obtenemos de la interacción con los robots sociales, que es lo que nos dijo la profesora Autumn recién. El experimento del robot en, en la carretera creo que nos dejó a, a varios pensando. Um, y bueno, agradecerle nuevamente a la profesora y quería también eh, a quienes nos están escuchando, a nuestro público, eh, invitarlos cordialmente a que nos empiecen a dejar sus preguntas para la sección de Q&A o de preguntas y respuestas, ya que muy luego vamos a tener a los tres profesores invitados conectados conversando eh, con nosotros para yo poder eh, darle sus preguntas. Eh, ahora quería tomarme unos breves momentos para eh, presentar lo que sería el proyecto de Robot Lab, que hoy, digamos, inaugura su página web. Eh, entonces, bueno, vamos a ir con eso ahora por unos breves minutos y luego volvemos a la sección de Q&A. Eh, el Q&A, eh, a propósito, va a ser solamente, bueno, en inglés, debido a que los tres panelistas eh, hablan ese idioma, entonces para los que están hablan, eh, viéndonos en español, por favor no olviden luego de apretar su botón en Zoom abajo en el, en el mundo para que pueda traducir del inglés al español. <música> Bueno, estimados y estimadas, estoy, eh, para mí es una satisfacción eh, grande poder presentarles hoy eh, nuestro nuevo proyecto eh, anclado en la Escuela de Comunicaciones y Periodismo, Robot Lab. Eh, este va a ser un laboratorio de investigación centrado en investigar los efectos de la robótica social eh, con un énfasis en lo que es la disciplina de las comunicaciones. Ahí ustedes pueden ver la, la página, eh, esta es bueno, primera vez que lo lanzamos al mundo, entonces felices si ustedes eh, visitan la página para tener una idea de lo que es eh, esta, bueno, es lo que va a ser Robot Lab. Eh, ¿Dónde estamos ubicados? Bueno, eh, ahora, bueno, por pandemia, estamos en, en, la, en la internet, digamos, estamos, tenemos nuestro primer sitio web que ahora es el lanzamiento oficial. Sin embargo, vamos a estar físicamente ubicados en, en la ciudad de Viña del Mar. Ahí vemos el campus de la UAI, el bello campus. Entonces, bueno, ahí vamos a tener una ubicación física donde vamos a poder llevar a cabo experimentos como los que mostraba el profesor Char Edwards, eh, en especial, bueno, con niños y jóvenes, que tiene que ver con medir los efectos de la interacción y variables principales eh, cuando estamos interactuando con estos robots sociales. Um, aquí esta es la slide con más texto, así que después eh, voy a tener menos contenido, así que no se preocupen, pero bueno, ahí eh, me parece importante comentarles um, los tres pilares en los cuales se va a fundamentar este, este proyecto y lo que pretende ser, ¿ya? También para que ustedes informen y para que luego, si tienen alguna idea eh, para poder colaborar o interactuar con nosotros, felices de recibirlo, ¿ya? El primer objetivo de este lab es eh, realizar investigación empírica sobre la robótica social, centrado en sus potencialidades sociales y de interacción. Desde la perspectiva de la ciencia de comunicación, como ya dije, con un foco en niños y adolescentes. 
Esto es muy importante porque en nuestro lab acogemos especialmente la interdisciplinariedad en nuestra investigación. Por lo tanto, si usted está bueno, en el extranjero o aquí desde Chile y trabaja en una disciplina afín a la robótica social, porque sabemos que en la robótica social confluyen bastantes disciplinas. Por ejemplo, la psicología, la ingeniería, la medicina, el diseño. Entonces, eh, la idea es si ustedes tienen ideas para investigar en conjunto. Nosotros estamos muy eh, agradecidos de su interés y nos pueden contactar. El segundo objetivo es eh, ser un centro de enseñanza y de divulgación de buenas prácticas para fomentar una comunicación beneficiosa con robots sociales y agentes asistentes sin cuerpo. ¿ya? Por ejemplo, Siri o Cortana. Eh, y el tercer eh, objetivo es, que es lo que creo que es parte de lo que se está logrando ahora en esta conferencia, es generar una comunidad de desarrollo y difusión entre la academia, medios, escuelas, organizaciones de la sociedad civil, gubernamentales y no gubernamentales, para reforzar esta potencialidad que tiene la robótica social, tal como lo mostraban nuestros tres expositores. También eh, debo mencionar que es algo que también me llena mucho de satisfacción y alegría, que eh, tenemos eh, dos proyectos eh, internacionales que están afiliados a nuestro lab, el que precisamente son de los profesores que nos acompañaron ahora en la primera porción. El primero es el Combot Labs, que es el laboratorio en comunicación y robótica social, fruto de una colaboración entre la Universidad de Michigan y la Escuela de Comunicación Nicholson en la Universidad de West Florida. Este laboratorio examina la interacción humano-robot y el rol que la percepción juega en estas interacciones. Ahí ustedes también tienen la página web de nuestro lab afiliado, cual ustedes pueden visitar, donde también tienen información sobre sus investigaciones y proyectos. El segundo proyecto afiliado también es el proyecto Child Robots, que nace al alero de la Universidad de Ámsterdam y es dirigido por el doctor Jochen Peter. Este proyecto, como ya mencioné al inicio también, ha recibido apoyo financiero del Consejo Europeo para la Investigación, ERC por sus siglas en inglés, y el proyecto realiza investigación empírica sobre el proceso de formación de relaciones sociales entre niños y robots sociales. Ahí ustedes también pueden visitar la página de este laboratorio, chatrobot.org. También, bueno, eh, ha sido también un, un gran eh, placer y honor es tener eh, colaboradores y mentores que están dispuestos a apoyar a este lab en su inicio, o sea, darle como el espaldarazo para que se inicie en Chile. Eh, tengo entendido que este es un laboratorio, el primero en su tipo a nivel eh, regional y creo también que nacional. ¿Por qué? Porque nuestro énfasis está estudiar, en estudiar los efectos de la interacción con, eh, entre humanos y robots pero siempre desde una perspectiva desde las comunicaciones. Nuestros mentores y colaboradores, tenemos al profesor Jochen Peter de Child Robots, y también del mismo proyecto Child Robots, eh, tengo la alegría de, de tener también a Alex Barco y Rinaldo Kune, que son investigadores postdoctorales en este proyecto. También, eh, por supuesto, los profesores Otto y Chad Edwards van a ser también contribu contribuidores y mentores, esto significa que, por ejemplo, podemos establecer algún tipo de cooperación en los futuros estudios con ellos, y además que pueden ser una guía en, en, en la nueva investigación que voy a realizar en este lab. Eh, ¿Cuál es esa investigación? Dirán ustedes. Bueno, eh, afortunadamente este año eh, se adjudicó, bueno, en realidad yo, <ríe> eh, un fondo de iniciación, que es de la Agencia Nacional de, de Investigación y Desarrollo, ANIT, en Chile, eh, se eh, adjudiqué recién un proyecto que se titula Mi Nuevo Amigo el Robot Social, entendiendo gratificaciones y determinando condiciones para interacciones beneficiosas en una muestra joven. Este es el título del proyecto Fondesi, que va a durar tres años y que nos da, digamos, también el espaldarazo inicial para realizar investigaciones similares a las de estos laboratorios de Fuera, pero aquí con una base en Chile y con una muestra chilena, que es muy importante. También otro fondo que viene a apoyar la creación de este lab es el Fondo Redes 2020 de la UAI, 
el cual analizará desde una perspectiva multidisciplinaria y comparada los múltiples usos y contextos donde puede insertarse el uso de un robot social. Por ejemplo, el contexto hogareño y en el aula escolar, determinando las prácticas y usos que le dan niños y jóvenes chilenos. Para este proyecto Fondo Redes 2020 también recibí el apoyo importante y vamos a colaborar con el proyecto Child Robots del profesor Jochen Peidot. Bueno, tras esta pequeña introducción, eh, espero que bueno, puedan visitar nuestro sitio para primero bueno, saber más sobre nuestras investigaciones, nuestros papers que ya hemos publicado. También vamos a tener una sección de noticias, que esto es muy importante, no solamente sobre nuestras propias investigaciones, sino que noticias sobre robótica social que puedan ser interesantes para ustedes. Está mucho pasando en el mundo con la robótica social también en Chile y es importante que exista un outlet, un lugar donde se publiquen más información específica sobre este nuevo agente. ¿ya? También vamos a estar publicando noticias sobre inteligencia artificial, agentes comunicacionales con y sin cuerpo como Alexa y Siri. También, bueno, ustedes pueden en la página también ver, eh, ver mis charlas hasta ahora, las que llevo, y también, ¿por qué no pueden proponer temas de charla y organizar charlas en conjunto con RobotLab? En especial, me refiero a este tema interdisciplinario. Además, el laboratorio tiene la intención de acercar a los estudiantes UAI, o sea, si tú eres estudiante UAI, puedes acercarte a, bueno, me puedes escribir o a nuestro email de contacto, y felices te podemos mostrar los robots que tenemos, o si quieres hacer alguna investigación, también eres bienvenido o bienvenida. ¿ya? Y por último, como ya comenté, queremos promover la interdisciplinaridad desde, desde las comunicaciones. Así que los dejo a todos, bueno, con, esta, con este cierre los dejo invitados a visitar a nuestro lab. Y ahora voy a dejar de compartir la pantalla y vamos a dar paso entonces al Q&A con nuestros tres profesores invitados. Hello over there, Autumn, Chad and Johan. Nice to have you here. <laughs> Could you share maybe first just uh, to have a greeting with you and what are your impressions if you have been able to be online? I, I, I guess you have been. Uh, what are your impressions about the conference and uh, were you able to see each other's presentations? Yes, yes, we were. We've been watching and really enjoying the, the few comments that have already started to appear in the chat and uh, watching one another's presentations. And I would like to compliment the organizers. This has been very fluid and welcoming and um, a great energy and educational experience, despite the fact that we're all in our homes. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's been a weird situation, right, with, the, with this pandemic. But I also think that this allows us really for the first time, and actually this is the first time the UAI in the School of Communication and Journalism is able to do this, uh, well, uh, online conference, like most of other conferences really in the world are going online. So uh, we have even people connected from Nigeria and, and other places. And, and I think this is fantastic to promote, uh, well, that people know more about social robots and to bring up like the many interesting questions that you brought us today. So I would like to again, thank you, uh, you know, thanking you for your participation and your great presentations. Um, I would like, well, you three brought really interesting questions and issues. There are questions about, uh, well, what, what do the social robot mean really in, in our perception? Uh, there are questions about doing research with social robots. There are questions about, you know, using social robots in education. So it's actually for me, it's really thrilling to be with the three of you. And I really have like so many questions I would like to ask. And we also have uh, questions from the audience. So, but maybe to encompass um, you all three, right? And you all, uh, your expertise. Um, You talked about several uh, var variables that you uh, use in your studies, right? It could be empathy, it could be trust, it could be, you know, well, the perception of social robots. And I wonder, um, what do you think is coming next as terms of, in terms of like variables, new variables or new contexts that we can study uh, with these agents, right? Because 
at least what I see from my perspective is that these variables are often used. Uh, I mean, some of them are new, but they are actually applied from other fields, let's say, um, not, not other fields really, but uh, more like other, other areas in communication, like social media studies, for instance. So do you think that these variables so far that uh, we as communication researchers, we have been studying, um, do, do really cover up all the spectrum of variables that we could study? Or you think that there are perhaps newer terrains where we can go? That's a really good question. It's really good. I, and it's, it's relevant to some of the ways that Chad and I, and, and perhaps Johan too, have been thinking about human machine and human robot interactions, because many of those variables that you listed, I think they are, they are the kind of things that we, that we think or feel about another communicator when we first meet them in initial interactions their impressions that we form and reactions that we have. But as our lives include more and more social robots and we spend more time with them and, and something, maybe real relationships, something like real relationships begin to develop, I think there'll be a shift to using the communication science and arts uh, perspectives that we've used for deeper human connections. For instance, Chad and I are now working on a project where we're exploring the relational dialectics, the very complicated tensions uh, that people face in relation to each other, but it appears also to social robots. For example, when at the same time, you believe it's important to be connected with the other and united and bonded, but you also value your independence and your privacy and your ability to act autonomously they're both important, but they conflict. And um, how do people do the, the very difficult but important work of navigating those tensions and balancing them? I'm interested to hear what uh, Chad and Johan think about variables emerging as important. It, it's an interesting time, right? Because we haven't had this experience with social robots and AI that we're gonna see new variables being developed. We have a long history, 30 to 40 years of looking at our human to human interaction and how it works in communication. So perhaps as we see an increased growth in machine communicators, social robots, AI, we'll see new variables emerge, new patterns, new interaction scripts that are specific to those machines. So our, a lot of the work in HRI and communication study has, studies has been taking previous variables in that human to human vein and translating them to human to machine. But what happens if we start finding new interesting variables? Does it apply to back then to people? And so I think it's a really exciting time to be exploring this. Well, if I <clears throat> may to join in here, I think that already, at least if you take the whole field in its breadth, you know, that is goes from engineering to philosophy, that quite a lot of variables have already been around or concepts, you know, that have been applied to, um, you know, robots or social robots in general. So um, in all honesty, I think we would do well if we focused on a few and really try to understand them properly. One of my, you know, favorite, but also one of, uh, I think one of the variables that is most convoluted is, for example, anthropomorphism. So the idea that we, uh, you know, attribute human features to uh, non-living entities. But to answer your question, I believe um, there will certainly, as Chad already said, um, if uh, robots continue to become better and develop things where they simply surpass uh, human uh, qualities, for example, in terms of their cognitive intelligence, but perhaps also in terms of their emotional intelligence, there will be situations where we really have to ask whether and I try to, to quickly allude to that in my talk, whether we need, simply need to ask whether all the paradigms we take from communication research or interpersonal communication research, human, human communication research, human, human communication, whether they still apply to really capture these situations uh, appropriately. That's the first point. Second point is um, that I think um, next to new variables, we have to think of a more long-term perspective on how humans deal with, uh, with, with, with social robots. Most of the research we currently know is um, based on the situation that a certain human, whether that's a child in my own research mostly, or adults or students um, in other research, where they meet a robot once and for the first time. 
And these are huge influences because, you know, if you meet um, a communication partner only once, you totally differently behave. And the second one is um, that uh, if uh, it's new, there's the so-called novelty effect in the sense that, oh, you might be super excited what this thing can do and, uh, you know, but that may behave or develop totally different over a longer period of time. And I think, um, as I think generally in communication research, this long-term perspective or more technically put longitudinal research as a form of uh, designing a study is really perhaps even more needed than more variables um, in our theoretical models. Great, uh, yes. Uh, thank uh, you all three for, for those answers. Uh, yeah, indeed, I think the longitudinal perspective is, is, uh, is rather needed uh, in, in the development of, of social robotics as a discipline. And uh, talking about discipline, uh, I allow myself to ask you, well, a, a second uh, question, uh, which is about um, interdisciplinary uh, work uh, surrounding uh, this, uh, well, exciting uh, new uh, area. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, well, you know, there are different uh, areas that, you know, I don't know if the exact word is collide or, you know, come together, collaborate with the developments of social robotics in the interaction. I mean, so we can, you know, already, of course, like design, um, interaction, even in the interaction scripts. Um, we have um, even medicine, engineering. But I was wondering, and then again, taking a long-term perspective, which is like always, it's nice to look, try to look into the future a little bit. Um, what do you think may be the, the next area that social robotics will kind of mingle with or get together with in the future? Maybe things that we don't even expect or know, perhaps it could be even more the development of medicines, thinking of like that we can include a, a type of like you know, develop a sort of like a cyborg human, or it could be something else. So I'm really curious to hear what, what could be your, your ideas there. That's a great question. Um, I think we're gonna see a lot more in terms of what you referred to as cyborg people, right? As we become, we start wearing more wearables, um, our smartphones, sensors become cheaper. Wi-Fi connections become cheaper. We're gonna start seeing more of the, the person and the machine blending together. And we already do that with smartphones and smartwatches, or I saw the other day, there are sensors you can put in your tennis shoes to indicate how far and how hard you're running, right? And so we're gonna see a lot of that. I think in terms of social robotics, we're gonna see a big push and a big drive for understanding those interpersonal relationships. Is it possible to have some type of friendship with a robot? or a relationship with a robot beyond those initial interactions or those more task-oriented uh, exchanges. And so can we develop a robot in society that has sort of that relational beingness? And we're still far away from that in terms of technolog technology, but the perception of it we get from movies, we get from Hollywood, and we see those interactions emerge. And what do people actually think when you put robots in the wild? So if you have a robot in your house, um, are you going to develop some type of parasocial relationship? And I think the easy answer is yes, but let's look at that long-term and see what happens. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think Carmina, to answer some of your question, I, I've noticed, um, especially in, in editing the new journal that there's growing interest in human machine teaming. And instead of looking at the social robot and the human being as discrete entities in the process to think, you know, what, what could we learn if we thought about their combination as a configuration or an assemblage? And I, I think it's really interesting because it, it may invite us the way humans and machines work together. Um, and sometimes in, in environments that are hybrid human and machine as well, to change the unit of analysis a little bit, to think about a sort of uh, macro organism in a way that includes both the human and the machine. And um, so I'm looking, I'm looking forward to seeing where that research on teaming and configurations leads people. Well, I'm, Camina, if I understood your, your question correctly, you were also saying so in this, this whole interdisciplinary endeavor that uh, you know, surround social robotics, what, what, what's really next. Um, a more general comment to start with, I think that the whole interdisciplinarity idea does not work as well 
um, as it sounds uh, good in our proposals that we write, you know, we do interdisciplinary research and, you know, you're then, at least in, in, in my case, you're, you're confronted with quite a reality shock, what these uh, machines eventually cannot do and, and how much really goes wrong. Um, but I think that there, um, in the longer term, um, maybe some developments, one is, in my view, clearly the developments in machine learning that sooner or later will become robust enough to, to also be put in robots, so embodied uh, machines, so things that you that have a body in, in, in the real world. That's the first point. The second point is that I believe that the whole um, uh, materiality of robots, again, I'm, I'm sticking to this point that robots are embodied, uh, may change um, through developments in, now, in, in nanotechnologies. And you see that already, not nanotechnology, but the idea of soft robotics, that the whole haptic um, component of robots will change. And I believe that that will have um, enormous impact on, on how we will experience robots uh, uh, in, the, in, in the future. That, that would be my, my idea about the interdisciplinarity um, from the design perspective. And on the other hand, I believe that uh, especially the turn towards um, emotion uh, and the realization, and I think uh, um, Autumn made that point very clear in, in, in her talk, that you know this whole idea of the you know human being so special, or this motivated probably by Christian thinking, um, may have to be um, seen against the backdrop of what some call the non-human turn. Um, and also in social science, that's the side that we really realized much of what we do is yeah, interpersonal, so human, human, but it does not necessarily have to. If you look back at the history of humankind, I mean, people talk to, um, you know, something they think exists, and we don't think that that was, is, is pathological necessarily. So why shouldn't that happen with, with, with robots, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay, Thank, thanks a lot for uh, those answers. Uh, I want to also take the opportunity, of course, because uh, people are there enthusiastically writing uh, their questions. So I'll go ahead with, uh, with a couple of them. Uh, Sebastian Herrera is, uh, is saying, uh, it has been puzzling to see my nephew engage in very engaging and conversations with Siri. He's four years old. The most difficult has been for me to make her understand it is a machine, a robot. She can't understand what's that. She is deeply, she deeply believes it is a human answering her. I haven't been able to make her understand that there is a robot behind the scene. Isn't that problematic? Well, I mean, I, if I may start, I, I guess um, you're, um, I'm talking to the one who asked that question, you're right, rightly asking this question of the ethics uh, behind uh, robotics and, uh, you know, the questions that at least I, I try to be very, at least I try to address it briefly in my talk about um, where uh, is something still acceptable? Where does an intentional deception of children in that uh, respect really start? And I believe that these are very important questions um, on the ethics of what we can do with uh, robots and uh, what robots can do. Um, and how people are educated about this. Um, so that's a, that's a rather general question. To my um, knowledge, this is not resolved yet uh, in the literature. You have um, various camps on the one hand, people who say this is deeply unethical uh, because um, it invites all this uh, relational inauthenticity. Sure, Turkle would be, would be somebody who would put forward that idea um, that it is uh, highly problematic in terms of all the, 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 the wrong uh, expectations it gives to children. On the other hand, people who would say, well, you know, that belongs also to, uh, you know, growing up, there are certain developmental steps that have to be taken that children take, children are deceived, um, and we, 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 we don't really find this a problem. Um, so that is, is again, a, a more general comment. Um, and then I would also say that what, at least I could only scan what you were writing here about Siri and um, what was it, uh, a four-year-old talking to Siri and not understanding that it is a machine. I would content that you find similar um, uh, observations and experiences also with adults. You know, I mean, we know from the very, uh, from, from a, a research paradigm, um, computers as social actors that, you know, very often people would, and the, you know, uh, people who invented the, the uh, or came up and tested that approach 
basically said it's a mindless, it's an automatic attribution and a, a, a automatic process that necessarily takes place. We cannot do differently and treat something that is a machine, even if we may know that it is a machine, but we necessarily automatically treat it as a human being. So that may, to some extent, not make it less problematic. I'm not trying to, uh, you know, say here everything in robotics is good and, you know, this is our future and we need to go that way. But it may perhaps uh, at least show how complex uh, this, this whole um, uh, observation and, and how we treat robots is. Thank you, Jochen. Uh, Otto or Chad, would you like to as well elaborate uh, on that? Yeah, I, I really love that question. It is, it is an important thing to be thinking about the consequences of, um, of young children's interactions with machines that are standing in for human beings. And I, and I really appreciate um, Professor Peter's answer about this too. And, and I would also reiterate and stress this perspective of what may be a hardwired or at least learned human tendency um, to, to treat all sorts of things as if they're other people, even when we really know they're not, when we know explicitly that they are not human beings, it's very difficult for us not to use the same scripts and the patterns of perception that we use with other people. And what I love about this question that, um, that the participant raised is that I think it shows us that our interactions with sociable machines, they tell us so much more about what we are than about what the machine is. Because what is revealed when children do that is something about us. It's a feature of the human experience that we are, um, we address the whole universe of things and concepts and ideas as if it can answer back. And, and, and we, it, the philosopher Martin Buber has called it pan relationalism, but that our whole uh, the part of being human is to talk to the world, things objects, animals, as if they're us and try to forge some, some sort of connection. So to me, it's disturbing when children do this, but it's also kind of a really beautiful thing. You know, it, it's, it's revealing of what humanity is. Well, perhaps Chet, if, I don't know whether you want to say something. No, I'm good. If, if I may just, just say something. I sometimes wonder whether we should turn the question around you know, the question is now, why do children treat machines as humans? And perhaps we should rather focus on the question, when do they not treat them as, as humans? Because what we also saw in our own research is, I mean, we, we, we can hardly do enough and, and, I mean, discourage the children not to find the robots nice and feel close to them and trust them. You know, I mean, it's, it's sometimes amazing how little you have to do to just kick off all these processes of, of relating. Uh, uh, and we are talking here about children, our research is on children eight to nine. So who are in a developmentally speaking different period than uh, the four year old child, you know, which is still a child developmentally speaking from, from early childhood, which very often would probably also deal with, with uh, 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 I would say, uh, a doll the way it, it dealt here with, with, with Siri, you know. I think then once they are able, by eight and nine, they should be able to make this distinction when they still do that. Huh? And perhaps I sometimes wonder whether our question is, is, is simple, should, shouldn't be turned upside down, you know, that we expect it and rather ask when does it not happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for that. Um, I have, um, I think, well, there are a couple of questions related to education. So, uh, but there are quite a few, so I will try to summarize um, all of them, I guess. Um, so, Veronica Bonoso is saying, um, all over the world, there is a resistance to incorporate simple technologies into the classroom. Educators argue that they lack time. Many do not feel confident to use technologies at school or simply they lack the resources to use them. There are also privacy concerns, et cetera. So she's asking what needs to be done so that social robots can effectively be incorporated at schools to support teaching learning processes considering all these challenges. And I would like to also add to that, um, well, a similar question from Felipe Araya with uh, their experience with CIMA robots. 
uh, they have seen that teachers are skeptical about the implementation of this type of technology in the classroom. However, when they start to program the robots to use with their students, they feel empowered. So which strategies do you think should be used to facilitate the process of this technology by teachers? Do you think that the massive use of this technology in the classroom will depend on all teachers being able to program them? So I think these questions are talking about this first, the, the initial teacher resistance to use uh, these social robots. And perhaps also for myself, may I add um, that like use social, so using social robots in education during a pandemic, it's, it's also a, a theme. Um, you know, you could kind of um, use uh, the robots at home to sort of reinforce what the teacher is saying via Zoom. So, well, I, I know there, there's a lot here, but basically it's about um, the challenges to, in, to effectively be, uh, to incorporate a social robot at school, what can be done uh, to facilitate um, that the relationship between the teacher and the robot. And then if you see any potential in actually using robots for like kind of distance education, there's a lot there, but uh, well, feel free to take any of those questions. I think the key is figuring out what the robot can do effectively. I don't think it's a panacea and you can just have a robot teach everything, but there's certain ideas or certain subjects. Research has found social robots are, do really well at sort of those repetitive tasks, right? So learning a second or a third language, a robot does really well. Teachers get tired of asking the same questions or having students repeat the information back. And a social robot might be able to do that well according to the research. The research has demonstrated that social robots do good with sort of basic mathematics education. Again, sort of that repetitive nature. But I think the question is, the larger question is, how do you implement this in the classroom? And I think that's the biggest concern because often the pace of our technology um, outruns our thinking, our policies, when the issue is looking at ethics or if it's effective. And so we have to constantly be testing, does this machine agent make sense for this particular context? I'll note in Chile, SIMA, um, is, a, is the robot that's developed in your country, right, in Chile. And it's a basic smartphone. I think it's an Android phone that goes in a body. And the research on that has shown it's pretty effective at getting students to think about these issues. And as the one question indicated, the teachers felt empowered by learning to do a little simple coding. I know in my own communication class, um, we, have, we teach students a little bit of Python coding um, and it does the same effect. It empowers them to like explore more if they want to. So I don't think it's a matter of having a robot in every classroom. I don't think that works. But I think for the teachers that are interested that we have to be able to find cost-effective ways that they could incorporate it at times. But at the same time, we have to be give, willing to give up things because of time, right? To using a social robot in the classroom is going to take time, which means we're not going to be able to do other things. And so we have to be strike a balance and allow that. Thanks, Dad. Think, uh, awesome. That's a really good question. I think there's also um, here in the U.S. a lot of resistance to using uh, sort of high communication technologies in educational environments. And um, what I hear a lot, one, one of the main reasons for that is that uh, people, educators are afraid of being replaced in their vital functions or displaced, you know, sort of pushed into a role that they don't feel comfortable occupying. So I think one thing we can do to, to ease adoption and to help people take advantage of these opportunities is in the framing, you know, to, um, I think about it as an educator, I don't want to be replaced by a robot, but many hours of my day, I feel like a robot. I'm grading things with a rubric, it's same answer to a question, email, email, email. And, um, and it's dehumanizing for me, you know, up, updating systems and, and doing that repetitive information labor. And I think if we can, if we can help people understand that um, by taking those aspects of your work and your experience that make you into a machine and offloading those into sociable, intelligent machines, we can become more human in the classroom, not less human. Because now if, if a robot is teaming with me to do those things, I can take a more pastoral role. I can have more personalized education, deeper um, empathetic and emotional connection with my own students. So I think that's a big part of it is, is is helping people understand that there are multiple ways a person and a robot can relate in the classroom. It's not 
necessarily a simple substitution, a replacement or a displacement, but it can be a, a reconfiguration that puts appropriate roles onto both agents. Um, I, <clears throat> I agree with what, what Horton just said in the sense that um, at least when you talk about robots in education in, or in other uh, areas, there is this, this, this fear of, you know, the robots take our jobs and, you know, this book, The Rise of the Robots, uh, at least if you believe that book came out, I think, three, four years ago, very clearly says, look, when the robots or if the robots, perhaps one should say these days, if the robots take over, there will not be. Um, this um, after some point of time that new jobs will be created. They will really ruin our jobs. So that is, I think, a fair point and one, point one should take that seriously. That being said, I guess when one has a look at what is currently possible with robots in the, in the classroom, then it's sometimes shockingly little that really works in a stable way. The first thing to consider is that it's, and, and Chad alluded to that, it's, it's usually more with repetitive, repetitive tasks, um, you know, teaching children in a military school, multiplication, these kind of things. Um, secondly, the robot is not supposed to be a replacement and currently certainly not possible in my view, but an assistant to a teacher. And here, I think one should also fairly say that at least in schools here in the Netherlands, um, you know, online uh, possibilities, uh, um, uh, teaching um, possibilities uh, via the computer are heavily distributed here. Um, my, my daughters go th use that a lot in the school they go to, and it's not, not exceptional or something like that. And that has been accepted. Uh, and the third thing, I guess, is, is also, look, um, my father is a school teacher. And when I told him I'm, I'm, I changed to robots and, and, and children, he said, oh, poor children. I said, why? You know, and then he gave me all the talk. And, and, and I said, but there are also bad teachers, right? And we have very often in our reasoning this idea that everything, just because it is human, is necessarily better than what machines could do. Now, again, I'm not trying here to be a, a, a tech utopian. I'm not trying to, to sell here robotics as something that will make the world a better place. Definitely not. But I think we should be fair in our thinking. And there are very, very, very bad teachers. And there are some children who, I mean, have been so discouraged by, you know, perhaps not even by being punished or something, just by giving not enough attention that probably would perhaps more, could perhaps more benefit more from a robot than from a bad teacher. You know, these are things I, I, I guess one, one has to take into account. And I also saw here one comment about uh, concerns about privacy and, and uh, um, surveillance and these kind of things. I believe that that is very, very important because a robot in the classroom may be a, a, a data collection machine. Um, and that is certainly something one has to take into account. That being said, it's not a new phenomenon. We also know that from all kinds of things that kids do online, you know? So it's, I think, a bigger uh, a field we need to consider here about, you know, how technologized uh, education has become. And I believe very pragmatically, we should simply see as, as I think Chad made a point, where is it really useful? And how can we make it safe and beneficial for the children? And also ask the question where it's simply not useful and where we should not do it. Thank you, uh, well, to you three, three again. Um, yeah, I think this, these are, are pretty uh, pressing issues about like incorporating a, a robot into the classroom. Uh, I have, uh, there was a question um, before about that as well, and it, it, it is related, of course, to what uh, you, Jochen, were just, just mentioning about uh, what can we do to ensure like a, a, a smooth transition to, to see the, the teacher as, as an assistant. This, this question has to do with more uh, policy, policy making. So uh, Luis Santana, he's asking um, to, all, to all three of you, uh, how would you suggest policymakers and decision makers should approach the regulation or the, the, the monitoring of these robots developments, especially thinking about the unexpected and non-beneficial impacts of uh, some technologies? <sighs> Difficult question, I guess, <laughs> or not? I, I think it's hard. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, Lana. 
Well, I, I think one of the difficulties when I start thinking about that is that different countries and cultures have such different approaches to regulation of their technologies. Um, you know, for example, in the United States, it's, it's well known that um, rarely do we put in place regulations before something happens. It's not like there's a group sitting around carefully considering the implications and establishing guidelines. It's a launch and learn model. They say, well, go ahead and do it. And later, if when the disasters happen, we'll figure out where we need to intervene and try to stop those things. Um, so it is. it has been an uphill battle, I think, for us to try to get a seat at the table beforehand and to say, we have to take an anticipatory mindset. We should be conducting experiments like the ones that you've heard about today to be able to to have a reasonable confidence in what the outcomes will be. We should have ethicists and social concerns experts in every um, policy and implementation body, but it's difficult sometimes. And, and I think it is in some ways easier for cultures where there's an established um, pattern of, of only launching these things in widespread implementation after you learn what the effects will be. So yeah, you can just wish us good luck in the U.S. because <laughs> whatever happens will happen and, <laughs> and much later we'll figure out, oh, we shouldn't have done that. We're going to have to change policy. Thank you, Autumn. Well, I, I mean, from a more historic perspective, when a technology is new, right, I usually these, these two camps, the the utopians and dystopians. You know, for one, it's the end of the world. For the other one, this is, you know, our future will be splendid. And, you know, and none of them is, is right. Usually none of them is right. Uh, for a simple reason, because people are not that stupid and they at a certain point of time learn how to deal with the technology. Well, that being said, we've now seen, of course, technologies that become so, how to put it, um, advanced, to put it mildly, that we simply have no idea how all of that works anymore. You know, I, I, I believe that 99.999% of the population have no idea how all these algorithms work that are behind all machine learning. And this is where I think currently, really, most of the money goes where um, you, need, you see, and, and, and Autumn said that different strategies in the US, uh, as far as I know more, you know, let the market uh, 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 decide. In, in China, a more state-driven uh, uh, approach did. The European uh, here, EU, uh, at least in the European Union, at least a more a regulatory approach to, to basically saying there are things we can do, but we should not do, right? And this is probably something, um, where, where there is no clear answer because it is, it is probably very uh, uh, culturally driven how we see these things. Um, and as much as I um, applaud uh, as a European perhaps, then also the, the, the approach of the European Union to it, um, as much would I also say that, you know, we learn about technologies also as they evolve, you know, and it will be inevitable that we will have some not, some, 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 some really, um, uh, not so nice experiences with technology to simply learn about it. But you cannot um, remove technology from other developments in the world surrounding. It's not just a singular thing that, that's happening. And so, so to some extent, I believe, yes, we should already now think about um, what can be done and what should not be done. I'm just dropping the term of uh, robots in warfare. Uh, you know, the development for robots in, in, in that field. Um, should we pursue that? I don't think so. I personally don't think so. It's my own, own personal opinion. Um, and at the same time, I think we, we need to accept that we cannot everything, uh, that we cannot anticipate everything and regulate uh, from, from the very first moment. And I Thanks. Think oh, Johan sorry. Said, oh, sorry. Super important is to, we need to have a greater cultural understanding of how things work, like algorithms, machine learning, how does interaction occur, and just general education of the population on this is what a social robot can do. It's not what happens in the movies. This is what it's capable of versus it's not capable of. And I even think our own politicians don't have an understanding of how coding or algorithms actually function in society and work to make decisions. And so a lot of it's just educating the population about how technology functions, getting a little bit of understanding of what's in that black box, right? 
Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, well, I, I think it's interesting when, when I hear you all three talk about as well how did these developments are shaped by the cultural perspective and what each country is going through, right? Um, I also here would like to share with you, I don't know if, if you're aware, but uh, Chile is, is, is building now its, its national AI policy and, uh, well, it's, it's um, drawn a consultative process with the population, which I believe is, is kind of uh, unique in the world, such a system where you ask citizens and uh, well, other um, important actors in society, what do you want for an AI policy? Uh, so I'm, I'm also very eager and interested to follow those developments, but it has been a little bit, uh, well, uh, with, with this bit of complications given the, the social revolt of, of last year. So uh, we'll see about that. And indeed, I think it, that, that will shape probably this AI policy here in Chile as other developments in the world, like in the US can shape those uh, policies. Uh, I would like to wrap up with, uh, well, um, our last question. Uh, I'm probably, uh, you get this question probably a, a lot, uh, I, I assume. Uh, um, so this is the question. What do you think about humanoid robots or androids? Taking into consideration the Uncanny Valley statement of Professor Murray, that suggests that humanoid objects which imperfectly resemble actual human beings can provoke a strangely familiar feeling of repulsion in the human observer. Is it then fair to build social robots that have similar aesthetics to us? Can we maybe find a different way to embody AI systems taking into account a post-human view? I love this question. I got chills. <laughs> it's a great <laughs> question um, because that is, I think that's the, that's the potential. That's what's really exciting. Um, like on the one hand, we have a lot of research that shows people do seem to respond better to robot partners that, um, that we're able to classify using the same system we use for other people um, to robots that have gendered representations, robots that are racialized as recognizable groups, robots that are more human-like in their voices and who have forms similar to us. So on the one hand, we have to acknowledge um, that there tends to be an interactional benefit of building things in our own image because it allows people some comfort of using the scripts that we've learned with each other on those machines, knowing how to interface. But on the other hand, you're exactly right that sometimes those designs get a little bit too human-like to not really be human and they, they can create re repulsion or fear in their interaction partners. And it's, it's one of the most interesting effects. The, the Morris hypothesis about the Uncanny Valley, um, it hasn't been uniformly upheld in research. So it also point the attendees to the fact that it is, it is not always what we actually find. You know, it, it varies by culture. For example, in Japan, there's a much higher threshold for highly human-like designs. Whereas in US America, people tend to be more comfortable with creaturely, you know, character-like designs. Um, but then it also depends on the, the ontological beliefs of the person evaluating it. And I think when I think about what the uncanny valley may really be, some people think it's evolutionary, maybe it is, um, that it's meant to keep us safe from disease or harmful others, and it may be, but it's also, is what happens when we encounter something that is between categories. So here is this thing, this highly human-like robot that's not just machine, it's definitely not person, it's in the liminal space, the between. And I think culturally, we're having a moment um, where we're trying to figure out, will it eventually develop so that we can say it is basically human? Just put it in that category and feel comfortable. Um, will it arise as its own unique ontology, something that is truly different and that we evaluate not in the same way as either group or not? But in the meantime, there are so many possibilities for taking advantage of that betweenness, that liminality. There's a great project by um, a group of feminist roboticists who've developed Q. And you can look at the demo on YouTube. The Q is the first genderless AI voice, and it's remarkable. Um, to think about what might a robot that isn't gendered at all sound like, even if it still sounded human, not machine, like what could that sound like? Um, and to explore um, alterity, not just, not just relationships of similarity, making everything in our own image, but because we create them, they're, they're made, not born 
we can perhaps like stretch the boundaries of human inclusion and relationship um, by designing them in, in ways that look nothing like us, right? We, we should do more of that, I think, to see kind of what happens and, and how it opens things up. But I, I want to hear what uh, Chad and Johan have to say about this too. Um, I agree with, with what uh, Autumn just said, <clears throat> that there are certainly, again, cultural differences. Um, I remember re having read a study that basically, at least to me, uh, convincingly, convincingly showed that, you know, in the Western thinking, the paradigm of how we treat robots is the Frankenstein paradigm. Now we have this idea of, Fra of Frankenstein, I think that's how it is called in, 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 in English. Now there is this idea we put a weird machine together and that is then you know, having all these negative consequences for us. And um, uh, uh, Autumn said that already. I think it's not, a, not by coincidence that for example, in, in, in Japan, a lot of these geminoids, so, so robots that really look like like a lookalike of a human, human uh, uh, being are made and are not treated or seen necessarily as so neg negatively. The question, if I understood it right, was, is it ethically okay to do this? Um, I believe the question here, that the next question that needs to be asked is, do we really know that the effects of having a, you know, geminoid or, or a humanoid that looks like a human being has really so negative effects and does it work at all? I see some developments in design that basically try to reduce uh, robots to the, 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 the very basics and, and move everything that could remind people of, of a human being uh, simply because it raises expectations and in the long term, they know that it simply won't work because people have these high expectations about what a robot can do. What eventually uh, and, and uh, 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 de facto it currently simply cannot do. So I would say currently the development is, at least in my subjective uh, uh, perspective, really not uh, going towards uh, making human-like robots. And um, the more general point and uh, uh, third point that I want to make is, I guess generally we should be aware of the biases, of the human biases we put into robots when we design them, you know? And there are all kinds of biases, you know, that the robots look predominantly white, you know, um, that they follow certain interpersonal uh, 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 patterns that are probably patterns of how people in the Western or in Westernized countries uh, uh, deal with each other and all these kinds of things. So that's, I believe, also something we need to take into account uh, when, we, when, we, when we talk about these questions. And I think we have space for some new interesting designs. Um, this is where I really appreciate HRI, human robot interaction being so multidisciplinary. There's folks looking at robots built like plants and how does a plant operate in trying to develop a robot. And so what Professor Johan said is completely true that we're trying to bring down the complexity, I think sometimes in the design because there's no way a social robot's gonna act just like a person or make the same facial expressions as a person. But if we can do it with a soft sock, for example, that moves and has a little bit of language, that creates a similar type of response. The same way a teddy bear does for a child or the pet rock in the 1970s, it can produce those interactions, but we don't have to worry so much, does it look like a person? It can just simply be a creature or a plant or something very basic like a sock um, out, coming out of Cornell, for example, it's a sock robot that simply moves and does interaction. Thanks, thanks all, all three again for, for those answers. Uh, well, I, I mean, this has been a really fascinating talk and um, the audience is also uh, really uh, following. And so uh, it has been a, a thrill for us to have you three here. And uh, so we're reaching the end of uh, our Q and A session and of this first uh, social robotics day. Um, I hope to see you all three at some point uh, here in Chile when the pandemic is over. <laughs> I'm sure of that. For sure. <laughs> Good. So uh, it would be great then if, if you visit us again at uh, UAI and we can continue to discuss uh, these developments. 
Um, I would like to also invite uh, the people who are still listening uh, for tomorrow is our third day of conference at 10, 10 a.m. And we will have um, Alison Hearn uh, from, um, well, I, I have to look at the program uh, again, sorry, but uh, at 10 a.m. we will have that, that uh, digital, uh, here, here I have it, sorry. Uh, it's uh, Alison Hearn uh, from um, the University of Western Ontario and David Craig, uh, professor and researcher at the School of Communication and Journalism at Annenberg, who will be discussing uh, digital labor. And uh, again, thank you very much. Yes, there Sebastian is helping me <laughs> with the, with the uh, in invitations. But um, well, again, uh, fantastic that you were all three here, here and thank you for your presentations. And thank you all who have been uh, watching. Uh, muchas gracias a todos. Hemos llegado al final de nuestro eh, segundo día de la conferencia de la tercera versión de esta conferencia eh, Social Media 2020. Los dejamos cordialmente invitados para mañana, que es el día del trabajo digital. Así que muchas gracias y bueno, nos seguimos contactando y viendo.